can go from one point to the other, but they can never backtrack to the origin. All they can do is go point to point. Okay? And it's kind of primitive systems, but they allow things to get done, high volume production. Um, the first NC machine tool was actually built for drilling rivet holes for B-52 bomber wings. It was a uh, machine manufactured by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, part of a research project. Um, and all it could do is incrementally drill holes, that's it. But, you know, when you're talking about thousands and thousands of holes on aircraft wings, that, that was a huge savings. Um, so it was worthwhile investing in the project to do that. Now, I'm going to give you a little drawing here, put up some basic dimensions. I'm going to make this as, as simple as possible. Um, for those of you guys that haven't really seen very many blueprint reading, or haven't seen drawings, things like tip, typical. What typical means is when a dimension is spaced, and there's other spaces that are very much just like it, it's typical, it's gonna apply across the board, okay? So, it's gonna make everything one inch. Let's see here, I'll make this one inch also. The only dimension I need to give it, I believe, is inch and a half to this first hole here. So here's a little example. Um, we're going to do a little exercise on the machines where you're going to indicate a bunch of little points on some plates I have up there. You're going to use an edge finder to find the corner, and you're going to change tools to a, um, just a little pointer, and we're going to point off the different positions. So that's a project out in the lab, okay? But what the difference is, first of all, we're going to do all these points that I have here all in absolute, then we're going to do them all in incremental. Now, we need some sort of indicator to say where we're setting the origin. So the origin on this little plate, and the same exact origin I have on the plates out in the shop, is going to be the lower left corner of the part. Okay? And a lot of times that's indicated by a little shaded in circle. This is a pretty common thing to do um, in machine shops. This is going to be our X0 position. That is our Y0 position right now. Okay? So as we look at this, we have our X axes, right? Y axis. This is our origin. Everything on this side is plus x, everything on this side is minus x, right? When I look at my y axis, everything is plus y, everything down here is minus y. Okay? So we're going to do these points two different ways. First of all, we're going to do an absolute, which is g90. chart, five points, okay, I need to number the points, it doesn't really matter that much doing these um, absolute because all the points are going to be tied in um, to the lower left corner, but when I get to incremental, it's going to make a big difference. The distance would definitely change if you get them out of sequence. Okay? So we've got all these points absolute. Absolute, basically, you, you know, you're going to use a tool called an edge finder, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. How many guys have anybody here never used an edge finder before? On a mill or the What's that? On a mill? On a mill, yes. Yeah. Alright, so an edge finder is a tool, yes, you, you run the spindle at about um, anywhere from 800 to 1200 RPM. Pieces like we've got some out there, so my picture is on the disc or not. Tab. There's actually four pieces in an edge finder. A little body right there, there's the tip, there's a little spring retainer, then there's a spring that connects the two. In an edge finder, it's precision lap surfaces, it should be made out of a tool steel, it's highly polished, and Depending upon the edge finder, that very tip diameter, very commonly for inch edge finders, is right at 200,000 diameter. Okay? They do make them in all sorts of other sizes. They make them in half inch diameter. Uh, the ones we have are 3 8 shank with 200,000 tip. You can buy them half inch shank. 
Um, you can also buy them with a pointed tip, which is really handy on a manual mill. Because when you get into hole sizes that are smaller than 200 thousandths, if you bring them down to the same exact Z level, you can just touch one side, touch the other, and find the center of your hole. Okay? It makes it pretty quick to do that. Okay, as long as you maintain the same exact Z position, so you're maintaining the same diamond tip. So they make some of the tip, um, make all sorts of them. The way it works is you run the edge finder about 1,000 RPM, and let's see here. Get your edge finder. There is your work. So with this rotating, you feed this into your workpiece very slowly. Okay, so we're gonna be going 1,000 at a time on our milling machine, and we're gonna keep doing that until you just touch the edge. And how you know for sure that you just touch the edge is your edge finder will move off center. Okay. Become very visible. Now, the edge finders, sometimes they move left to right, which is, makes it very handy to see. Sometimes they move back and forth, which makes it kind of difficult if you're staring at it. So you gotta have to look in there, look around the side of it, and check it out, okay? Also, a good quality edge finder, like a, a Starrett or a, um, a Brown and Sharp edge finder, they will work a lot better than the less expensive edge finder. You can go buy a general edge finder from Harbor Freight of all places. And Harbor Freight, you're gonna buy that edge finder for about seven, eight bucks versus the $25 edge finder you're gonna buy from Starrett. But instead of getting an accuracy of about half a thousandths, you're gonna get an accuracy of about five thousandths. Okay, because the way the good edge finder will work, when you touch this edge, you're within about a half a thousandths of that surface which for just about all production machining work is, is pretty much, that's fine, that's good. Okay, unless you were dialing in the center of a bearing, pressed in bearing or something like that. Um, and matter of fact, if I was doing that on a job, I would still start off with an edge finder. Because the nice thing about the edge finder is, it gets you really close really quick, okay? Then I'd take my edge finder out, then I'd put in my high precision 10 reading indicator, and then I would fine tune it and dial it in. Okay, the edge finder will get you there very fast. A cheap edge finder, like the Generals, for example, uh, the ones you get, you know, China, which pretty much anything you buy from SPI now is from China, and then you buy the Fowler now is from China, so I'd stay away from that stuff. Um, as you feed into it, it's actually gonna move off, and then it takes about five thousandths of pressure just to make it move. So basically on those edge finders, you gotta back it off until it's, it's straight. And are you on the edge or are you not? It's really kind of hard to tell. Okay, so you definitely get what you pay for. Um, Starrett's used to be really good. I used to always say buy Starrett's. They used to be the best edge finders out there. Um, the last batch I got from Starrett, they, right in the middle of a demo, I had one fall apart. <clears throat> it came unscrewed from here, and then we've had that happen to several of them. So if you're looking to buy edge finder, I would highly recommend this guy here. Fisher Machine. Independent guy. I think he's in Torrance or Hawthorne. Um, he has an eBay store, Fisher Machine Products. He makes edge finders, little precision ground D blocks. He makes it all right here locally, sells it through his eBay store. And his edge finders are really nice. And they're only about 11 bucks a piece, 11 bucks a piece. So he, might, he makes some really unique edge funders too. As a matter of fact, I think the next batch I'm gonna, the college doesn't like me buying from eBay stores, at least with a purchasing system, but I can petty cash things, so maybe I'll, I'll buy a handful of them. They'll give us a pretty good deal too. Totally to give us 20% off. Anyway, so there is a pretty good local source for these guys. Anyway, so we're gonna indicate this corner, we're gonna find out exactly where that point is, as close as we can anyway. Indicate this position. So if I do that first position absolute, we're going to take a edge finder route, put our pointer in. You're just going to bring the machine over so you're lined up just pretty much on the crosshairs, okay, and record your position. But so this first point in absolute is going to be one inch and one inch, right? Now, writing out one inch. You should always at least include the decimal point. Okay? Try 
to get you guys to write things out now the way you really should. Because uh, one inch, I mean, I, I write at 1.0, and I write it that way a lot of times, mainly just so it's, I think it stands out a little bit better. Okay. Um, this zero doesn't mean anything. Okay, a trailing zero like that. But the decimal point does. Okay. If you just put one, yeah, I mean, I know you probably, I know you mean one inch, more than likely. Okay. But does a machine know that you mean one inch? It all depends upon the machine that you're on. If it's a Haas or a Fennec, you know how it interprets that one? If you actually have to input it into the control, that's how it interprets that one. 10,000? 10,000, 110. 110. This goes back to the day of um, NC programming systems. They, they used to be all incremental many years ago. Long time ago. <clears throat> but CNC controls, up until about the mid-70s, a lot of the controls did not accept decimal values in the program. So if you wanted a program an X position of one inch, this is what it looked like. That was X of one inch. 10,000 and 10,000. You always gotta count from like tens place, tens, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands. There's your one inch. Okay? So the machines today, they're made to be fully compatible with the program that was written in the 1970s. Okay? They're fully compatible. So I, I would imagine somewhere out there in the country there's some some machine shop that's been running the same exact aerospace part since 1972. They're probably running the same exact NC program. Okay? It's pretty sad if they never made that thing a little more efficient. But anyway, I'm sure they're out there. They're still making money on that job today, probably. Running the same program on a brand new machine. Because that program written without decimal points, you can feed it right into one of the newer machines and it'll run. Because that's the way it'll interpret. So if you just put X of one, You didn't go to X of one inch, you went to X of one tenth. Okay, so always think about that. When that gets really nasty is when you're on a CNC lathe and you're backing out a turning tool to index it. And you got a six inch, you know, I don't know if you guys have a, what's called a divide boring bar on your turret. You got a boring bar on your turret, six inch divide boring bar is probably about a $2,500 boring bar. Okay. And that bar was six inches, and you meant to back out seven inches so the index could clear and not crash and flip your boring bar on top of your chuck. How far did you index it to the turret back? Seven, seven tenths. Seven tenths. <laughs> what happened to your $2,500 boring bar? Or $10 down. It just did. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, it just <laughs> broke across the, broke across the chuck. So anyway, desk points are very important. And even if you're on a machine where it doesn't matter as much, a Kuma, for example, would take that as um, seven. But don't ever get in the habit of writing it down like that. Always put the decimal point. Okay, because you walk across to a machine, a Fennec machine, takes it doesn't it has to have the decimal, and you want to make sure it's there. Alright, so always at least put the decimal. I will always put the zero there just because I think it shows up a little better for you guys. And for you guys, like when you're a machine 115 writing your manual programs, I would recommend just putting up one point. Okay? Because you've got to realize every extra character you have to type in on your manual programs is an opportunity for you to make a mistake. And I keep going back to the standard keyboard that you're going to be using. The stupid O is right by zero. zero. So there's a high probability of you accidentally pressing the O instead of the zero. What happened to it, it, The machine doesn't take it. It'll log out. Nothing, nothing bad. Just that when you, just a little bit of frustration. You're going to go there, you'll be all excited, you get your program running, and then all of a sudden it's going to warm out. And you go, why is it warming out? There's nothing wrong with it. And I'll, oh. spot it. I'll spot it right away. But if you guys aren't really, your eyes aren't trained to look for stuff like that. Anyway, all right, so back to this thing. So position two, it's just two inches in X. Y stays at one, okay? Going to three, three inches, Y stays at one. Going to four, inch and a half. 
Lambda y goes up to 2. Moment of 0.5. It's just adding everything relative to the, the corner there. This would be an example of baseline dimensioning. Everything's off to one side. 2.5 and 2, 0. So there's all those points in absolute. Okay. So now we're going to do these points incrementally. Make my chart a little bit different doing it incrementally. Because I gotta tell you where we're starting from and where we're going to. Okay? So I'm gonna say from the origin, one. And then I'm gonna say from one, two, two, three, three, four. And when I get all done, I'm going to go 5 back to the origin. Okay. okay. Something else we're going to do on the incremental system. And this is how you check yourself on an incremental system. We're going to add up all of our numbers. At the very end, I should get 0. That's how I know I'm right. Okay? So that's kind of an important thing to do when you get an incremental program. 